Trip Hawkins is a confident man. He describes himself as an innovator as well as a business person and he's certainly not someone who would shy away from taking a risk. When he got wind in 1987 that Sega was looking to make a new console, he could have simply overlooked it, given Nintendo had around 90% of the market and Sega's 8-bit master system had failed to take off in the way it had hoped. But he didn't. He made a determined effort to get involved and he effectively turned his company Electronic Arts on its head in order to do so. EA was founded in May 1982 and it set out to do things its own way from the start. The company was positioned as a gaming equivalent of a record label and Hawking treated individual developers as stars. He's always been a freedom fighter for developers, perhaps more so than anybody else in the history of the gaming industry. He cared about how the customer could have a better experience and he wanted to enable developers to flourish and have more freedom and capacity to create. His company therefore became an attractive publisher to work with and it flourished over the course of the next few years. But even though everything was going well in the home computer market, it was becoming more and more difficult for Hawkins to ignore the growing impact of the consoles. For a while the video game crash in 1983 had dented Atari's ambitions to a degree, Nintendo's launch of the NES in Japan in 1983 had begun gathering momentum and it was blowing the competition away. Hawkins didn't much care for consoles, they were making computer games and the console market was closed. The first generation involved Atari and it didn't allow third-party developers. Every game for the Atari system was made by Atari themselves until Activision broke ranks in 1979. It was very different on home computers though. EA could produce floppy disks and cassettes whenever it wanted and there was no question of any revenue share with the manufacturers of the machines. So can you imagine what it felt like when Nintendo came along and said, ok, here's the deal. You have to give us a third of your revenue, you only get to make 5 games a year, we have to approve the games, you have to let us manufacture the games and then you have to let us put the cartridges on a boat and they will take a month to reach your country. Such a stupid policy. Far from embracing Nintendo, the West largely decided to sit things out. Nobody really jumped on the Nintendo bandwagon, so when Nintendo succeeded, it was not only shock and surprise, but an incredibly disruptive thing to see happening. Because if Nintendo takes over, the whole industry will be slave working for them. The unfolding situation in the mid to late 80s prompted Hawkins to have a fresh look at the console market, but the only thing Hawkins knew for certain was that he didn't want EA to produce games for the NES. Nintendo was a step backwards for us. We felt it was prolonging 8-bit and it had minimal sound and graphic capabilities compared to the Amiga. It was also restricted to cartridges, which cost 10 to 20 dollars to manufacture. We didn't want fixed upfront costs for manufacturing, inventory left over that would have to be buried in the Arizona desert. It was then that he began to do lots of research. I was looking at this situation and thinking, Nintendo is winning. What do we do now? I'm thinking that I would go around and talk to hardware and operating companies to find out what their plans are. And it was during this time that he heard Sega was bringing out a 16-bit machine based on the Motorola 68000 processor, which was used in the Apple, Amiga and Atari ST computers. This info intrigued Hawkins immensely. Sega hadn't been very successful in the console market up to this point. The Master System had been squarely beaten by the NES in most parts of the world and while it had fared well in Europe and brilliantly in Brazil, most industry watchers saw it as a failure. But Hawkins felt he had to, at least, get involved with one of the consoles and he felt Sega would get it right this time around. He knew the processor well and he completely believed Sega's pedigree in arcade gaming would stand it in good stead. He thought about how he could help Sega, but have freedom and he also thought about 
what would be beyond that? He felt that they really had to get off cartridges. I said to myself, OK, here's a stepping stone. We can fulfill the potential of 16-bit, see it become affordable, and gain multimedia features and then jump to 3D graphics and CD technology. I wanted to bet heavy on the Sega Genesis, but plan ahead. First and foremost, though, a way in had to be devised. It was then that Hawkins noticed an intriguing development. Tengen, a publisher and developer created by Atari Games, had tried to negotiate a less restrictive license from Nintendo. But when talks failed, it looked to bypass the NES's 10 NES lockout chip, so that it could publish without permission. This led to a series of lawsuits over many years, but it enabled Tengen to launch unlicensed games. This whole Tengen dilemma got Hawking's thinking. So he studied the situation and concluded that he could legally reverse engineer something, but consequently be sued for trademark, copyright or patent infringement. Knowing Nintendo did indeed have a patent on its lockout chip, he decided to turn his attention exclusively to Sega, which was more of an unknown entity. The thing with Sega, though, was that EA didn't know the technical details of Sega's upcoming 16-bit system and if it would have patents like Nintendo, so he was uncertain if EA would reverse engineer it. But what EA did know was that the Mega Drive slash Genesis was going to come to market fairly soon and be a couple of years ahead of whatever Nintendo got up their sleeves as their future 16-bit machine. Hawking had a shot at early market leadership in 16-bit console. It was worth the gamble and the risk. So Trip Hawking made a crucial decision. EA would reverse engineer the Mega Drive and carpet bomb the platform with its games. We're going to leverage our experience and our software assets based on the Motorola 68000. We had used the workstations for development and built a lot of games on the Amiga and Atari ST and we had licensed games like Marvel Madness, the coin-op hit that was made by Atari and we had more than one game like that. This processor was a processor of choice in the arcades. It was going to be easy to migrate the code. Everything was slotting into place for EA, and it pondered its options in 1987. If the cartridge capacity could be big enough, it felt it had the makings of a good product line. But there were some hurdles with EA needing enough money not only for development, but for the inevitable lawsuit and the production of cartridges. Hawking sought to take EA public. He also started to focus more on EA's growth plans leaving the day-to-day -day administration to his newly hired senior vice president, Kenneth Zerbe. Hawking heard that the Sega Mega Drive would be launched in Japan in the fall of 1988. Generally, companies would launch their new products in Japan first during the fall, then in the following year in the US, then in Europe and later in the rest of the world. So, as soon as Sega's 16-bit console comes out in Japan in the fall of 1988, EA's representatives would travel to Japan to buy one, bringing it back home and start reverse engineer it. Then when it comes out in the US in 1989, they would study the US version to see if anything has been changed. If it hasn't, they'd be in business. EA figured it could take a year to reverse engineer the Mega Drive, by which time it would have a good idea of the ins and outs of the machine and be able to compare the Japanese and US versions to see if the coast was clear. EA was looking to release their first games in 1990 so that they could be a couple of years ahead in the 16-bit console market than anyone else. An ultra-secret project was on. A machine was obtained from Japan as planned and it was brought to the US to be reverse engineered. As you might imagine, there is tremendous heroism involved in a reverse engineered job like this. A hermetically sealed room is needed, facilities that are commonly known as clean rooms, and an engineer would enter that room with the one and only goal of figuring out the system by looking at copyrighted information in order to understand Sega's black box and make a copy. For that, a debugger is essential to peek at the code while a game is running. The engineer will then study that code, 
until he deciphers it and reverse engineer what the Mega Drive was doing with those code statements. The code that displayed on the screen via the debugger was an illegal copy, but fair use laws provided a loophole. It had been established that the appearance of copyrighted source code in a debugger was fair use as long as the person looking at it didn't take advantage of the information later down the line. In other words, as long as those who were reverse engineering the console didn't then go on to make a game for the Mega Drive, no law was deemed to have been broken. So basically, if a games developer volunteers to go into that clean room, he cannot later write a game for that machine. As simple as that. If this isn't heroism, I don't know what it is. The act of going into that room for several months, building tools from scratch and climbing Mount Everest is a very dark, lonely and desperate journey. It's like Lord of the Rings, you're going to stick the ring into the volcano. And you're doing that knowing you are never going to make it home to what you do for a living, which is make great games. You will have to watch all your colleagues make them instead. The process was led by Steve Hayes and Jim Nichols, and EA soon got what it needed. In the meantime, Sega had been courting third-party developers and publishers ahead of its expected US soft launch in August 1989. Among those it sought to open talks with was EA, but Hawkins was giving nothing away. They tried to convince me to make games for the Genesis, and I literally spent a year talking to them periodically and maintained a front. I didn't want them to know what we were up to, and it wasn't their business. I would candidly talk to them about my concerns and issues about them copying the Nintendo model and why I wasn't on Nintendo and why I wouldn't be on Sega under that kind of license agreement. But I said I liked their machine. In each case the response was the same, so Sega would laugh and leave. But EA was an important company, so they would come back and try to talk EA into it. Hawkins was just keeping them in a state of limbo because he wanted to make sure they would not be threatened or concerned by what EA was doing. EA was in a strong position, it knew the machine inside out and it had cash from going public. It wasn't aware of any patented technology and it had games such as Bullfrog's Populous and John Madden Football. It knew it could have the first games potentially up and running and relatively bug free by March 1990, but it was also time to come clean. Hawking said intended to announce what EA was doing in June 1990, but in the two months beforehand, the sales team was going to be calling around with details of the upcoming product line. That's when Hawkins realized it was time, as a good corporate citizen, to go tell Sega what they have been doing and to discuss whether or not it is possible to be partners or whether they are going to have to do this without them. I was pretty sure I was wasting my time talking to them. I was pretty sure we would go to market without their support and that they would sue us. The lawsuit would go on for years and we would win. Hawkins was clear, he laid out his own deal, told them he didn't need their intellectual property and that he'd reverse engineered the Mega Drive. He said he understood they wouldn't be able to sell games with Sega's seal of approval, but that he wasn't intimidated by that. EA intended to create packages that didn't suggest there was any Sega involvement. He also said if Sega wanted to go to court, EA would happily fight them for years. Like the Big Bad Wolf, Sega tried to huff and puff and blow EA's house down. One of Sega's arguments was that Hawkins was the CEO of a public company and threatened to take Electronic Arts to court, announcing to the world that they had infringed Sega's intellectual property, consequently destroying EA's stock price. There was some back and forth over the next few weeks, but the CES in Chicago was getting closer and closer. They both knew that one way or the other, 
a civilized conversation would take place. Hawking believed both companies could partner together and go shoulder to shoulder in the marketplace and fight Nintendo. But it would take a completely different type of license agreement, one that would use Sega's trademark which EA would pay for but at the same time have control of their own factory and make as many games as EA sees fitted. Sega began to agree. EA settled on a deal of a $2 per unit license fee and it was allowed to make its own cartridges. Since EA wanted to publish 20 titles in the first year, this was good news. Even so, Sega's people were laughing, thinking it was the most ridiculous thing they had heard. So EA cranked it up and shipped more, sending Sega a message. Who's laughing now? Hawkins decided there would be a heavy emphasis on sports simulations, including John Madden Football and FIFA International Soccer, and that suited Sega, which needed unique selling points over Nintendo. But that was a sticking point. EA wanted a $2 million cap on the license fee. This shocked Sega, which threatened to call off the deal. It got to the point where even Hawkins board members were urging he drop the demands. They say we have to sell a million units just to reach that. But I said, guys, this is one of the few occasions, as the CEO, that I'm going to make a decision that reflects the fact that this is not a democracy and I'm going to get that cap. He got the agreement within a week and EA went full speed ahead. With a three-year lead on other publishers, EA became an important partner for Sega. Its prolific nature provided the volume of titles needed and the games became a major selling point for the console. EA repaid the faith by supporting the Mega Drive until 1997, which was way beyond all of the other major publishers. During that time, the Mega Drive sold 31 million units and smashed Nintendo's monopoly. As for that cap, well, EA sold more than 20 million games which meant it had saved EA around 40 million dollars. It was the icing on the cake of a very canny set of circumstances. If you've enjoyed this video, consider supporting the channel monetarily through Patreon at patreon.com slash it's a pixel thing or using the thanks button below. To keep up with what's going on with the channel, check all my social media stuff by clicking on the link in the description. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you all in my next video. Cheers!